Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Lagore, and welcome to the Skywatcher What's Up webcast, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, sorry for the intro glitch there, um, but I uh, thank you all for tuning into the What's Up webcast uh, this morning. Uh, we do these every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and each week we try to cover a different topic on astronomy, astrophotography, or pretty much anything we feel like, and this week we're going to be going over Dobsonians, and we're going to kind of keep this basic. So for some people this might be a review, for other people you may be looking at a Dobsonian, thinking about it if it's right for you. Hopefully this uh, webcast will be helpful, um, and this is a recorded, so well, it's live right now, but it will be recorded. So if you need to go back or review anything, you can always go back. Or if you've missed any of the What's Up webcasts, you can always go back and rewatch the episodes. And if we didn't get anything uh, or cover something that uh, you might want to know about, you can always email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Title it What's Up webcast and shoot us your question. And we can either answer it there or you can always give us a call as well. Now, like I said, this week we're going over Dobsonian basics, and these are great telescopes uh, to get started with, and we get a lot of people who are interested in them, so we thought this week would be good to cover um, just kind of the real basic fundamentals of owning a Dobsonian and kind of what to look for if you're thinking about one. So uh, we're going to get started on that. If you have any questions, just save them to the end. Um, I will get to them when I can. But uh, thank you for joining us this morning. So let's get started. So Dobsonian telescopes, if you've ever been to a star party and you've walked the field, you notice there's a lot of things that look like cannons. Uh, those are Dobsonians, and they range in sizes from tiny little tabletop three inch to massive uh the picture that you see right here this is texas star party that is a 36 inch obsession telescope i think they only made like five or six of these scopes um that is a 17 foot orchard ladder right next to it just to give you some scale huge um so dobsonians it's really sky's the limit um unintended maybe we did intend um, but let's learn a little bit about them. So Dobsonians were a concept uh, from a gentleman named uh, John Dobson. And many people who are in the outreach, astronomy outreach communities are very familiar with John Dobson. His whole goal was to make astronomy more accessible to people. And He's really a legendary figure um, in the astronomy world. And he came up with a very simplistic setup to allow people to use or build a telescope with limited money um, and real basic things. And basically all he did was take a Newtonian telescope and put this on like a Lazy Susan style mount. He did this in the 1960s is when this design came up and he was very open with this design and it caught on over the years to where people started making their own telescopes. Obviously larger manufacturers like us here at Skywatcher as well as others started making Dobsonians. Um, but the, the fundamental thing about a Dob is that it really gives you the ability to have a larger aperture telescope at a decent price or easily made by yourself. Um, keep in mind, this was in an era where your only option as far as mass produced or produced telescopes were gonna be small refractors from uh, big brands uh, stores. So we're only talking like 60 millimeter, I mean, 80 millimeter refractors, you know, we're, we're getting pretty big. And when you're starting to push up to the 100 or 130 millimeter, so four or five inch, um, they were getting expensive and they were very long focus, long tubes. Uh, this was really before the era of uh, some of the Schmidt-Cassegrains came into play. This is 
right around where um, I think Celestron was getting started. Um, so this was early before we have as many options as we do today. We really have an amazing selection of equipment right now. So now has never been a better time to basically get into astronomy, regardless of who you choose to go with or if you build your own. Um, there's so many options now that you can choose that would really make your hobby fun. Um, but the Dobsonian really started in an era where owning a 6-inch or 8-inch or 10-inch telescope was really kind of unheard of. So John Dobson was showing people how to make their own mirrors out of like uh, plate glass or like ship porthole windows. Um, making your own mirrors, making your own telescope um, to where you could actually have something that really allowed you to explore the night sky um, with more light gathering power. Well, nowadays, we've kind of accelerated a little bit more where this has taken off quite a bit. So you see Dobsonians all over the place, and this is the gentleman that you would have to thank uh, for making that possible. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but he was a major influence among the astronomy community and left his mark by providing us the Dobsonian telescope. So we're just gonna run through a basic overview of what you're gonna find on a Dobsonian, because I have a lot of people who call in. Um, they might not know what each piece on the telescope is. You know, a lot of times it's a doohickey or a thingamabob or something like that. Well, there's terminology that we should probably learn, which can make your understanding of your equipment easier. And if you need assistance, it's better when you understand what you're talking about. So just a typical Dobsonian. We're going to use our classic 250p um, Dob as just an example. Um, so it is a Newtonian telescope. The telescope itself is nothing fancy. It's been around for years. Um, and this is made up of two mirrors. You have a primary at the back that's parabolic. So it has a parabolic curve ground into the glass that focuses it up to a flat secondary mirror uh, and bounces it up into the focuser where you would look um, with your eyepiece. So this is just a standard Newtonian telescope. Now, if you're new to Newtonians, because they use mirrors, it's upside down. The view is gonna be upside down. This is just how physics work. I've had people call me before saying, I got my telescope, everything's upside down. That's normal. Um, because we're using a mirror-based telescope, it's going to be an inverted image. I'm sorry if you don't like that. That's just physics. Um, but in reality, when you're looking up in space, there's not really an orientation at that point. So it doesn't matter if it's upside down or not. You're still going to see what you want to see. So standard Newtonian telescope, parabolic primary in the back focuses to a flat, what we call elliptical secondary, because it's an elliptical shape, it's not circular. I don't have, I should have brought one, I have one sitting out somewhere. Um, focuses it to that mirror and that bounces it up into your eye. Now, the Newtonian telescope is then mounted on a basic alt-as mount. And these are very simplistic mounts. You've got left, right, and up and down. Very, very simple. You can grab the telescope tube and you can point it over here, you can point it over there, left, right, push it all around. It's really smooth. Um, it just uses uh, usually like a Teflon bearing. Um, some of our telescopes as well as others use a uh, like a needle roller bearing um, assembly. Regardless, there are bearings in there that allow you to have a, a smooth, rotational surface to make the telescope easy to point in whatever direction that you want to point it at. Uh, it doesn't get much simpler than that. And what's nice about this is it gives you a lot of aperture. We're talking six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, whatever. 
on a very simplistic mount. Normally you'd have to take a Newtonian telescope, put some rings on it, put it on a like an equatorial mount. Then as it moves across the sky, the focusers and all these weird spots on the side, it just gets annoying. So this makes it very, very easy, very simplistic for you to go explore the night sky with a good amount of aperture and you don't need any crazy exotic hardware to do it. Uh, so up at the top of the telescope, uh, normally mounted on the side, this is the focuser. It's got the focus knobs. This is where your eyepiece goes into and it allows you to get a nice sharp focused image. So that's the focuser. Um, usually right next to that is a finder or finder scope. Uh, these come in all different types. Uh, normally you have these little optical finders, which are basically a mini telescope. They've got some crosshairs in there. You could get some other ones like red dots or my personal favorite, a telrad. Um, and these are all different finders you can put on there to help you point and aim the telescope around once they've been aligned to the main telescope. Uh, next, you have the base. Uh, the base is obviously what the telescope itself sits on uh, and allows you to move it across the sky into different areas. Then we obviously have the optical tube, which is the telescope assembly itself. This houses all of your optics, your two mirrors, and keeps them all aligned. And then on the back, we have the mirror cell, which handles the primary mirror of the telescope. And you can't see it, but down in the front portion of the tube, right down in here, is the secondary mirror. And that sits on kind of this crosshair uh, assembly that we call a spider. And that holds the secondary in the middle of the light path there. So light hits the primary mirror, jumps up to that, and then comes out the focuser on the side. And that's basically all a Dobsonian is. Short, sweet, to the point nothing fancy so that's why Dobsonians are generally really popular because you can get like a 10 inch telescope like what you see here for like 600 five or 600 bucks and you've got a 10 inch telescope a 10 inch telescope is a massive amount of light gathering power you take that to a dark sky you're gonna be busy for years on what a telescope like that can show you you want to take a telescope of the same size and uh, put it in any other design, it's going to be quite a bit more expensive uh, to do that. So a Dobsonian is going to give you, it's basically giving you a lot of light gathering power for not a lot of money. So we'll get into the advantages and disadvantages of the Dobbs um, moving forward here in a bit. So there are different types of Dobsonian telescopes. It's all the same, uh, it's all basically the same system. It's just uh, different on how we handle the telescope tube itself. So the first one, of course, is just the classic design. Um, this is a closed tube. They're generally made out of metal. Um, sometimes they were made out of like sono tube or cardboard tubes. Um, you don't see those too much anymore. Um, you could still, there's a lot of people who still make their own Dobsonian telescopes. Um, a sauna tube is a really quick and cheap and effective way to do that because you can get them at the hardware store. They come in all different sizes um, and it works well. But they can get kind of heavy. So obviously for more large format manufacturing like we do, we've got um, aluminum or metal tubes it's thin walled lighter weight um, which is helpful but if you want to make your own you can make one out of a sauna tube from a hardware store quick easy cheap and that's what john dobson was doing as well that's what his tubes were primarily made out of so standard tube standard base nothing fancy that's just the classic design right there um, the next design, which is kind of one that you just find here at Skywatcher, is the, and I try not to, try not to make this like a big advertisement. We want to make sure this is educational, but I want to make sure you guys get all the major. So the next um, style is a collapsible, which this is an open tube design. 
This generally uses struts or something like that to allow the telescope tube to extend and retract down, making it more compact for travel. Um, these are more compact than the closed tubes. The problem when you have a closed tube classic design is that that's going to be a big tube. And, you know, when we're talking like a six inch daub, those are normally like F8. So you're already talking like four feet long at that point. And if you want to make a bigger one, like let's say you want a 12 inch, now you're talking five feet long. And sometimes that becomes a travel problem. And I think most of us can agree that we always want a bigger telescope, but travel becomes a problem. And that's something we're going to talk about here later. So there's a lot of a lot of these other designs are really to accommodate travel capabilities, um, especially when you go up an aperture. So uh, for Skywatcher here, we have a collapsible design. Um, this allows the tube to shrink down. It still holds the alignment really well for the mirrors. And but this design is also limited by how big you can go as well. Now for the largest, we have the truss tube daubs. Um, this is my old 20 inch obsession. Um, it's gone now, I'm making a 28 inch telescope so I had to sell this one to fund that. So uh, it's really, really difficult to make a tube daub for a 20 inch telescope. This telescope is eight feet tall when pointed straight up. So if you imagine traveling with an eight foot tube and some companies like Discovery Telescopes, they had a cool split tube design where two tubes would come apart. That's better, but now you still have two 22 inch, 24 inch diameter, four foot tubes. It's still a ton of stuff to haul around. Um, so in order for you to ha basically make portable large aperture telescopes and we're probably talking 15 inch and up at this point especially when you get to like 18 and 20 inch and larger truss tubes are like the only way to go um so the truss tube design is nice because it's more compact uh especially for larger apertures uh, it is going to require alignment every time you set it up because you're disassembling the optical tube. That's not too difficult. We'll talk about that here shortly. But uh, one thing is, so the class, well, we have the whole layout here of all three. The classic Dobbs have a closed tube system. So the advantage of that is if you're observing in a light polluted location, there's no external light that's going to come in from the side. And hit the mirror and give you glare and all kind of like that so a closed tube is nice for that um, if you're having these open systems like the collapsible or a truss tube system where it's opened you're going to need a shroud uh, which is what you see up here and that covers the open portion of the tube and kind of seals it away from light from entering the side of the tube so uh, those are the three main styles. There's a lot of people who've made their own variations of these for making them more compact or kind of unique designs. I've seen them where they fold up on each other. Um, you know, collapsible is all different kinds. So that's all, all different kinds of options. It really just comes down to what size telescope we're working with. And that's where each style comes into play if you have tube dobs those are going to be good for probably six inch to 12 inch um, the collapsibles obviously we make those in eight inch to 16 inch and then truss dobs kind of start to becoming a question when you hit 12 inch um, even a 12 inch truss dob is really really tiny and portable um, but by the time you get 14 15 and you get big a truss tube is like the only way to go if you want to realistically take it anywhere so those are the three um, major styles of dobsonian telescopes so let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of some of these telescopes and we'll get into the the nitty-gritty there so advantages uh, 
a big advantage of Dobsonians is aperture. They're the most cost effective way to get a large aperture. Um, the telescope you see me standing there in the picture, that's a 42 inch uh, Dobsonian that was up at the Grand Canyon last year. Uh, huge, huge telescope. I'm almost six feet tall. You can see how big that rocker box is with me standing next to it. It is a massive telescope. So um, there's no way you're gonna make a one meter refractor. Um, there is one, you can go check it out. Tube's like 40 feet long. Go to the observatory, check that out. Um, so if you're a aperture fiend and you want the biggest freaking thing that you can get a hold of, a Dobsonian is gonna be probably the easiest way to achieve that. And you can get Dobsonian telescopes from like three inch little tabletop to whatever your heart's content. Uh, there is a kind of a modified Dob up in Utah that's a 70 inch. Um, that's the largest I'm aware of. There is a, uh, out by the Texas Star Party, there's a gentleman who owns a 48 inch uh, telescope. You know, there's manufacturers that'll be happy to build you like a 25 or 30, 32, 36, all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so if you're aperture hungry, Dobbs are the way to go. I will say though, aperture is not always everything. You have to have the conditions, the seeing conditions, the sky stability to use larger telescopes. When you start getting into that 30 inch class, if the seeing conditions of your location are not good enough to support it, it's kind of a waste. I've, I've been to star parties where I've looked through a 36 inch. It's the biggest, baddest thing on the field. And the view was kind of eh, where you could go down the way and you'd look through a 25 or a 28 at the same object and it was much sharper. And that's because the seeing conditions can support certain apertures. So, uh 28 inch is probably the largest telescope you can do where most of the time the seeing conditions will support that aperture size and on down when you get to these monster telescopes the image is going to be bright but it's not always going to be super sharp and detailed because it becomes very reliant on the conditions of the evening that's why big observatories that have like these four meter, six meter, eight meter diameter telescopes, they're on mountaintops where they know the seeing is good um, because it can support it. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna get to that uh, imaging with Dobbs here in a second. So hold off on that and we'll cover that here shortly. Uh, so again, uh, you can get Dobsonians from like little tabletop three inch to custom one meter, you know, it just depends on how much money you want to throw at it, really. Uh, they are the best bang for the buck. You know, you like I said earlier, you can get a 10 inch uh, Dobsonian telescope for five, 600 bucks. And you've got a 10 inch telescope. You can look at galaxies with that. The planets look amazing with that. You've got 10 inches of aperture, um, so that opens up a lot. Um, so Dobsonians are gonna give you the most amount of aperture for the least amount of money. And aperture is gonna help you see those faint fuzzies or resolve those crazy details on some of those planets and the moon. That's very helpful. So if that's what you're into, if you're into visual work, um, Dobsonians can be awesome. Uh, they're generally really simple to use. You literally just grab the tube and push them around. Um, you can get more exotic by adding go-to systems or computer assistance like digital setting circles, which can hook up to like a, a controller box or now like iPads and apps where you can actually manually move it around the sky and it tells you where it's at. So um, there's all kinds of options there. That's an excellent all-around visual telescope. They're good for the planets. They're good for the moon. They're good for deep sky because they all have that aperture. So um, that's the big advantage of this. 
So disadvantages of a job. Uh, they can be really cumbersome. Again, here's that 42 inch job that was up there. Um, and it doesn't have to be some big monstrous thing like this either. Uh, sometimes an eight inch telescope is too much. Um, I have a lot of people who get these telescopes and they're, they're a little uneasy because they expected it to be smaller. Um, so just kind of understand what you're getting yourself into regardless of the manufacturer or whatever. Understand what you're getting into, like how long the tube is gonna be, how much is the base gonna take up, uh, can you store it, do you have to walk it downstairs, uh, is your car gonna be able to support the telescope that you're getting. You know, if you've got a small little Fiat, you might be limited to what you're gonna work with. Um, even like a small little Civic style um, car, you're gonna be limited. Uh, with a tube that's four feet long. It's gonna take up the back seat. You still have the base to worry about and maybe you wanna take your family along with camping gear. So, you know, you wanna think about how you're gonna transport this telescope. It doesn't always have to be some monster thing. It could be something small, but most of the time Dobsonians can be more cumbersome. Um, the bigger ones though, if you're getting big like big big we'll say 18 inch and bigger um, I have a lot of friends of mine who have scopes that big I've owned scopes that big um, there's a lot of people that always say oh, I would love to own a scope or my dream scope is this um, it's normally some big scope uh, those are gonna require some specialized equipment to transport them sometimes they need ramps to roll them into the car because they're heavy uh, you might need a trailer if it's a really big telescope, uh, the ladder to climb up to look through it is something you wanna think about. Um, all of that is additional stuff you have to bring with you. It's not just, I'm gonna go out with my eyepiece kit and telescope anymore. It's there's specialty equipment that has to be there to support it. For some people, it's totally worth it. For other people, not so much. It's, you gotta ask yourself what you want what you want out of it and what you're willing to put into it and it's not a one-size-fits-all argument so before you dump a bunch of money into something think about what you want to do what are your goals of, of doing this and can you do and move the equipment that you're looking at now there are some ways to get around the cumbersome uh, argument and one of those is faster optics so if you've seen before the f ratio on a telescope where it says like f8 or f10 or f6 um you can make those smaller uh, nowadays we've gotten better with the technology uh to make faster optics now we're talking about telescopes that are f most dobsonians like that we make at skywatch are about f6 to f4 um, we sit in between those now, there are some custom manufacturers that can make faster optics. Now we're talking telescopes that have F4 or sub F4 mirrors like F3.6 or 3.3, even F3. Um, when you have a faster F ratio optic, it makes the focal length shorter and much more compact. So this is something to consider, especially when you're going into larger telescopes, we'll say like 15 inch and bigger. Um, sometimes you can actually get someone to produce a mirror that's really big with a fast F ratio and it's really small and compact. Um, downside with this though, is it's gonna cost more money because it's difficult to manufacture those mirrors. And they also show a lot more coma and we're going to address coma that's an optical uh, phenomenon that hand uh, occurs with a parabolic mirror we'll talk about that in a minute uh, for example if we're talking small and compact the telescope you see here this is elvira um i forgot her owner's name unfortunately he's a really nice guy though 
Uh, he hand built this whole thing. He had the mirrors built by a master optician. And this is a 24 inch F 2.75. This thing is fast. Um, I think it's the fastest telescope I've ever looked through. And it's super short. This is, it's, the mirror is 24 inches in diameter. Most 24 inch daubs are about eight feet tall. Uh, this thing I think is like five. I'm about six feet. I have to crunch down a little bit when you're looking through it. You can actually be seated and look through this telescope most of the evening. So when you're looking at these bigger telescopes now, you have the option to get custom uh, fabricated mirrors um, that really fast. So you're gonna have to talk about the coma problem, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but it allows you to get a big telescope and a really small package. Um, excuse me. Uh, and there's plenty of them out there. And they're, I mean, this telescope is freaking awesome. Um, you really have to go to like Texas Star Party or wherever he's going to be there to see it. This particular telescope. There's so many cool things he put on this thing. It's awesome. Um, even the little thing back here, really quick. If you see this little tank tread looking thing, this is a cart that he made. It actually slides up to the telescope, grabs the telescope, picks the whole thing up, and then with a joystick, he rolls it up into the trailer. So he doesn't have to pick up anything. He made all of this, um, but it's ridiculous. It's it's one of the coolest telescopes I've ever used, but yeah, it's a 24 inch F 2.75. So really fast, really compact. It's actually shorter than our Skywatcher 16 inch, but it has like twice the light gathering power of it. So, um, Really cool stuff right there. Um, there's a whole write-up. If you actually Google Elvira telescope, um, you could Google the regular Elvira, but it's not gonna be a telescope. Um, you could Google this. Um, there's a whole write-up on Cloudy Nights uh, website about how he built this. But anyway, we're getting kind of sidetracked here. Um, Another thing about Dobsonians, particularly like the truss Dobbs, the bigger ones that you have to break apart, they do require collimation or alignment of the optics. Uh, this isn't that hard. Um, if you're a beginner, um, it can be a little cumbersome at first, um, but it's it gets easier. So don't worry too much about collimation. You'll get it down with the right tool. Now, Dobbs are not ideal for astrophotography, and this is why. So, first off, astrophotography, when we're taking long exposures of faint objects, it requires tracking. Now, there are go-to Dobbs. We make go-to Dobbs. Um, you can get go-to put on pretty much any of the bigger Dobbs, like Obsession, Star Master had stuff, uh, Teeter Telescopes, New Moon, all of those companies can put go-to on a Dobsonian telescope. But it's it's not, oh, it's not quite the answer. So when stars cross the sky or when the Earth rotates, it's rotating equatorially. So stars rise in the east and they set in the west. But they move in an arc across the sky. Like if you ever take a long exposure and do star trail images that streaks in kind of an arc. Go to Dobbs are out as telescopes. They're not equatorial telescopes. They don't track in a nice arc like um, equatorial mount would. They, they track more in a stair step matter where it's kind of over, down, or over, up, whichever way you're going. Over, up, over, up and kind of like the little diagram you see here, uh, that's how they track. They don't accommodate for that arc. So what that means is you're gonna start getting, um, they don't accommodate basically for the rotation. So as we track across the sky, you can see that that's rotating. They don't accommodate for the rotation of the sky. And the problem with that is you're gonna have pinpoint stars in the middle of your image and you're gonna have streak stars on the outer portion of the view. And that's called field rotation. And there are ways around that. They're not cheap, they're complicated. 
So it's jobs aren't great for astrophotography. There are people that are doing it. I've seen some very impressive stuff, but it's really short exposures, a lot of them, and you're stacking that. Uh, they're really good for lunar and planetary work because you got a lot of aperture on there and you're shooting really quick. So um, that's something that you can actually uh, work with there. But if you have any interest in doing astrophotography, now there are other ways to get around it. You can get like an equatorial platform. Those can be kind of pricey and they have to be made for your specific location. So there's ways to do it. It's not ideal. If you're planning to get into astrophotography, you'd probably be better going off with an equatorial mountain or refractor or something else. Uh, but a DOB should be kind of your backup buddy. While your imaging scope is running, go use your DOB. So that's my take on astrophotography and Dobsonian. Uh, lastly, they can also suffer from coma, um, optical aberrations. So uh, coma, happens with parabolic mirrors it just it just occurs so it's just a natural thing um, the faster the f ratio or the faster the optics the more severe the coma is presented in the telescope and coma looks like this um, in the middle the stars are going to look good and then out towards the edge they're going to kind of smear out they kind of look like comets um, by the way if you haven't gone out and looked for comet c 2020 f3 neo wise uh, go check it out it's in the evening um, but these are going to look like comets on the outer edge of the, the field. And the faster those optics are going to be, like if we're talking these fast optics, um, like F3 or F4, you're going to see coma. Uh, so it's smeared on the outer edges. Look like On severe stuff, it looks like seagulls. Now this can be addressed with correctors called coma correctors. There's a variety of them. Um, and this is this doesn't matter if you're doing visual or photographic on a Newtonian telescope as well. This happens with any parabolic mirror. So uh, you will need a coma corrector. Now, coma is kind of funny. Um, it bugs some people, it doesn't bug other people. Um, I think coma correctors start to become something you should look into if your telescope's like f4.3 and faster. Really, when you get to f4, I think you need a coma corrector. Um, but f4.5 is pretty forgiving, especially if you've got good eyepieces with good correction on the edge. But um, around f4 is where you want to start looking at a coma corrector. Um, there's a variety of that of them out there botter makes a nice coma corrector for visual um i think the best one is the teleview paracore um it's adjustable for certain things so you could check out one of those those all handle really fast optics as well that's coma uh lastly is collimation and we get a lot of people who ask about this a lot when you're a beginner uh, collimation is basically just the alignment of the optics and this can be done with either collimation eyepieces. Uh, some telescopes include them. It gets the job done, but I think the better way to do it is a laser collimator. I know there are people who will fight me on this one. Um, there are some other more specific tools like a Cheshire and stuff like that you could use, which are good. Um, but a, a good laser collimator is generally all that you need. Um, and this is really a must. If you're getting a Dobsonian telescope or a Newtonian telescope for that matter, a nice laser collimator should be something that is on your accessory list like immediately because eventually you're going to need it. And most of the time the telescopes hold alignment pretty well. So if you do need to make adjustments, it's, it's going to be minor. Um, if you get into a trust Dobsonian, they might be bigger adjustments. Um, Collimation isn't scary. Um, I remember when I was getting started that collimation was kind of a freaky thing. You're you're messing around with the optics of your telescope. Um, but nowadays, a lot of manufacturers have tried to make that easy and really design things to hold alignment well. So a nice laser collimator. Um, there's a lot of affordable ones out there. Uh, the Hotec laser collimators are very nice. 
Um, the the Howie Gladder lasers. Um, if you never had a chance to meet Howie Gladder, he was awesome. But uh, he made some amazing laser collimators. I usually tell people if you can get to a more quality laser collimator, like a company like Hotec or the Howie Gladder lasers, um, some of the cheap ones you want to be careful about. The reason being is that a laser collimator also has to be collimated. The laser in there has to be collimated so when it puts in there you know that it's straight. Um, I've had people before get inexpensive laser collimators that were out of collimation and if the laser's out of collimation and you go to collimate your scope, the scope's out of collimation. Um, it's rare but it does happen. Um, so if you can invest in a little bit better collimator, and it's not much more um, from like a more reliable company, then you know you have support there. If it is out of alignment, they can adjust it for you. Um, but yeah, having a laser collimator is a must, uh, regardless of who you buy your Dobsonian or Newtonian from whether it's you know affordable like what we make or really high end um you want a good laser collimator in the box it's it makes collimation <laughs> like that um and you don't need an extra set of hands um, anymore a lot of the collimators have like a little target on the side where you can see the reflection come back up makes it really quick really easy to do um, alignment in the field um, obviously we just covered that real quick so how a laser collimator works is you put it in the eyepiece focuser which is right up here it fires a laser down onto the secondary down to the primary and then the primary bounces that right back up and back up into there and basically what you're trying to do is you're just trying to get the reflections lined up on top of each other um, and this is normally done by adjusting the two mirrors now a Secondary mirror has usually three adjustment screws behind it on the spider secondary holder and then the primary is going to have a set of collimation screws and they just pivot that mirror in the cell and that way you can move it. Uh, most primary mirrors nowadays um, have a little donut sticker or some of the higher end manufacturers actually diamond etch. Um, and etching to center mark the mirror and that way you know that's the physical center of the mirror it makes alignment a lot easier so something to something to think about so if you get like any of the manu uh, mass produced jobs like from us or from anybody else they do have a little most of them do uh, have a little center mark sticker it looks like a donut on it leave it there don't peel that off um, that's to mark the middle of the mirror makes collimation a lot easier. That's collimation there. Um, when you're new, again, this can be big. Uh, once you've got it done a couple times, it should only take you like a minute or two to really address your collimation unless it's like whacked out of its mind. Um, but a good laser collimator can make that really easy and effective for you. Okay. Real quick rundown, then we'll get to questions. Uh, what to look for. So if big things, if you're getting your first Dobsonian telescope, here's what I tell people to look for. Number one, you want one that has a parabolic mirror. Um, There's some really, really cheap stuff out there that doesn't have a parabolic mirror. There's spherical mirrors, and it it just doesn't give as sharp, doesn't give the sharpest image that you can because you're gonna get all kinds of weird spherical aberrations in there. Um, I get they're inexpensive, but if you're really looking for a nice Dobsonian, and most of the $200 and above are parabolic mirrors. So look for something that's got parabolic mirror, a nice focuser. Um, obviously, everything on the market right now is a decent focuser. You can upgrade it if you want, but a good focuser is nice. Um, and something that has collimatable optics where you can adjust the, the mirrors to align. Um, Cause if anything's out of alignment, it's not gonna give you as sharp of an image. So um, parabolic mirror, nice focuser, collimatable optics. Those are probably the three things that I would take a look at um, if you're looking for your first Dobsonian telescope. 
Uh, for beginners, if you're just getting started and you're not sure what to get, I would probably say, I have it listed right here as three inch to eight inch. Um, if you've got kids, a small little tabletop three inch is probably fun to play with. Um, if you could find a five inch to eight inch telescope, that's probably where I would start. Um, this is our little Heritage 130. It's a five inch tabletop daub. Um, parabolic mirror, collimatable optics. Uh, a five inch or bigger, things start to get more fun at that point. Um, if you step up to a six or an eight inch, now you're in more of a serious territory. Um, but these are all relatively budget friendly. You can find them for under 400 bucks for the most part. Um, it's a good bang for the buck. Um, so if you're getting started, try to find something around a five inch to eight inch. Now, if you want a little bit more, you kind of know that you want to get into this, you're serious about it or you're experienced and you're just looking for a second scope or third or fourth or fifth or sixth or whatever, because um, we know one scope just doesn't stop. Um, at least not here. Um, eight inch to 16 inch. Um, these scopes, you know, you can get a really high end eight inch that does really nice stuff. You can get up to 16 is still portable, but it's gonna show you a lot of stuff. Um, this is a, a nice telescope to bring out to dark skies. That's gonna show you a lot more. So something to take a look at if you're in that middle tier. Um, you know, if, if you're an advanced beginner, I'd probably look at something like a 10 inch, maybe a 12 inch. Uh, 12 inch galaxies really start to pop more. Um, and then of course you can get into the big stuff like 14 or 16 inch. You can go bigger if you want, just know what you're getting into like we talked about earlier. And then if you're just hardcore, you've been around the block a couple times, you know exactly what you want. Go big or go home. Um, 16 inch, 14, 15, 16 inch or bigger. Um, this is where you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, you've been around the block before. You've played around with the smaller scopes and you just have to go with the biggest freaking thing that you can find. Um, so in this category, this is where I like to call dream scope category. You're gonna be saving up a little bit for something like this. You know what you're doing with something like this. Um, but it's pretty awesome when you're starting to look through big, big glass, like 20 inch, 24, 25. Um, obviously the seeing has to support it. Um, but just be aware that when you get a telescope this big, it kind of owns you. So make just know what comes with the territory when you're getting to a scope at this level. So. That's what I would break that down into. Uh, that's pretty much it for this week. Uh, hopefully that's been somewhat informative for you guys. Um, but before we go into questions really quick, next week we are doing books, charts, and other literature. We're gonna be talking about different books and stuff like that that we think is really cool for astronomy. These are like books you can take out into the field like star atlases or you know, just stuff that might open your mind a little bit more to different things up in the nighttime sky. So that's next week's topic. Um, so join us then. Uh, so if you have any questions right now, feel free to ask. Um, I know for a lot of people in the chat, this has probably been review, which is okay. Um, we do these to be educational. Um, we know we are Skywatcher. Yay, Skywatcher. But we, we really ultimately want this to be educational. So whether you buy from us or someone else or you make your own or whatever, you know, we want to show all aspects of the hobby. That's the whole point of the What's Up webcast is for us to explore all different iterations of astronomy and hopefully get people excited about that. So hopefully you've been enjoying it uh, throughout these different episodes. Um, we're still working on our special guest speaker. Let me see. Nope, I haven't heard back from that yet. So we're not there yet. Um, but I hope you guys are enjoying these. Uh, we like doing them. It gives us something to do, especially since the world is all kinds of screwed up right now. Um, it kind of lets us hang out together for an hour um, as well. So 
Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying that. If there's a topic that you'd like us to cover or at least look into, you can also email us at support at skywatcherusa.com and ask us to take a look at it. And we'll try to do a topic on it. It takes a little bit to build some of these videos. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to look into it, but we're always looking for new topics. So uh, I do thank you for all of those who are watching us every week. Um, if you missed it, that's okay, because we're, we've got these going all the time. So uh, if you have any questions about anything, um, you can always email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Um, you can give us a call and uh, do that. Uh, Mike, uh, when did they drop the Stargate models? So the Stargates have been kind of fun recently. Um, I'll just be totally transparent and honest with you guys right now. Um, we've had some issues with, and I'm not even sure what exactly the issue is, but on the go-to models at the moment, um, some of them, not all of them, um, have had this binding problem. So right now we are taking a look at that. Um, we're hoping to address it. Um, we have a new sample of that, of the go-to base um, here. We're hoping to get that tested. And if it looks good, then we'll, we'll bring them back up. But we don't wanna continue to have issues or put people in a weird position if the go-to base is having issues. Uh, the manual ones, no, no problem. That's just the go-to base. But every time you add go-to to a DOB, things get complicated and messy. So at the moment, we're trying to get this go-to problem addressed. That's why the Stargates aren't available at the moment. So hopefully we can get that figured out and they'll reappear again. Uh, let's see, what's next? Harold Johnson, on a go-to telescope, how do you keep the electronics up to date? Um, Most of the, elect so electronics generally have firmware updates that are done. Any manufacturer is gonna be doing that. So our engineers are always working on new firmware updates. So whoever you bought through, keep an eye out for that. Sometimes those updates address bugs, sometimes they might not. Usually there's like a release note in the firmware that'll say what it addresses. Um, but that's how I would keep the electronics up to date. Um, just keep your firmware uh, up to date as well. It's like, like your phone, just make sure the updates are updated at that point. Um, if I didn't get that exactly, then uh, you can also email us. Uh, let's see, Jeff Lucas, astrophotographer, how do you clean your daub mirrors? That's a fun one. Um, the way I do it is first you have to take the mirror out of the telescope carefully. Um, depending on how big the mirror is, you could wash it in the sink or the tub or the shower. Um, I've washed up to a 20 inch mirror in a shower, it works fine. Um, if you got a really big mirror, you could always do it in like one of those inflatable kiddie pools. Um, but I get two gallons of distilled water, a bundle of uh, cotton balls, a roll of paper towels, and a bottle of the Blue Dawn dish soap. With the first gallon of water, you're gonna put that to the side and don't touch it. The second gallon, you're gonna put a drop or two of Dawn dish soap into it and shake it up so it gets all soapy. And then get the mirror set up in on a flat surface and take your clean water, the first one that has no soap in it, pour it into the mirror and fill it up like a bowl to where it actually fills up the curve of the mirror. Um, take some cotton balls and just lightly, don't drag them, don't put force on them, just lightly pull them across in a circular motion starting from the middle and working outward and chuck it after that. Um, from there, and that's to get some of the loose dirt. You can take a blower bulb to get loose dirt and stuff off of there before you clean it. Um, but to get the real grimy stuff off of there, you do that. Um, once that's done, 
uh, rinse that. Then fill it back up with the soapy water. Do it again. And then once you've got all the grime off of there, rinse that off again with the clean water a couple times to get any soap off of there. And you can dab up any little leftover water beads with paper towels very lightly. Um, there's a lot of videos from opticians on YouTube that can go over this a lot better so you have a visual, but that's how you do it. Um, let's see. Uh, Jeff, when you do your Star Party webcast, what is the URL slash site for that? Um, when I do my webcasts for uh, the digital star parties, that's www.focusastro.org. Um, that's the website. You're looking for Star Stream. It's under events. That lists all the coming events. Uh, right now, we don't have any planned. Uh, we might do something with the planets and the comet that's up, so stay tuned for that. But uh, that's what we're looking at at the moment. Uh, let's see. My FlexTube 250P has started to have some stiction in the azimuth. I've seen suggestions about using soap to lubricate the Teflon pads. Just wondering what Skywatcher suggests. Um, sometimes that's just dirt and build up from use. Uh, what I would do is just kind of wipe it down, yeah, with soapy water or alcohol or something like that. Just get the dirt off of it and see if that helps. Okay, I think that's everything. Um, if I missed one, yeah, that looks like all the questions. Um, if I missed anything or if something pops into your head after the fact, uh, go ahead and email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Um, title it What's Up Webcast. Just write whatever your heart desires in there. Um, and we'll be happy to check it out. Um, if you like what we do, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I know that's the most YouTube thing ever, but um, that keeps you up to date with what videos are coming next. You get informed with when we're going to do a new video. So if you, you want to keep up with that, you can subscribe to our channel and that way you're notified when we do things. Um, no, I'm not doing a, a live stream tonight. Um, maybe next week, stay tuned to that, but, um, uh, yeah. All right, guys. Well, that is pretty much everything for this week. Again, next week we are doing, let me flip this real quick. Oop. Um, we are doing, let me get rid of this too. Oh, uh, we are doing books, charts, and other literature next week. So join us for that. Um, we're raking together quite a list of books, um, even some stuff uh, that wait, you might not have heard of before. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll see you next week. We are still working on our special uh, speaker um, for f uh, the last week of this month. Uh, hopefully by next week we'll have that officially pinned down and we'll let you know who that's going to be. And then keep an eye out for next month's topics, which we are currently working on as well. So thank you very much, guys. Have a clear sky. Um, go out and look at the comet. It's pretty cool. It's in the northwest just after sunset. Um, it was slightly naked eye visible, at least from here in Phoenix uh, yesterday. Um, I know you're not going anywhere, so that's a good chance for you to take a look at it. So um, thanks again. Uh, clear skies, hopefully, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Take care, guys, and have a great